So you know how the big play in Monopoly is to go from homes to hotels? Well, that's exactly what Mike Shogren did, but he did it in his Airbnb business. We're going to talk with Mike right now about how he leveled up from STRs to hotels. Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. You're listening to me, Kyle Stanley, and I'm very excited about today's podcast with Mike Shogren, a good friend of mine. And um, he and a few other coaches and myself are all part of the seven figure mastermind. We even do a trip every year. Last year, I got to spend a lot of time with Mike in Breckenridge, Colorado, and have been with him in a few events this year. He's become a good friend of mine. He's someone that I would consider uh, definitely uh, a mentor in this business as well, because uh, we've got a few hotels that we're looking to acquire, and he's been able to help me kind of underwrite those deals. And that's exactly what he's going to show you today is how he went from managing SCRs. He's owned a few, but now he owns and manages some hotels as well and uses a lot of what he's developed within his short-term rental business to basically escalate up to that exit strategy. So if you're ready to learn about hotels, I'm telling you right now, Mike is the guy. He's going to have so much power for you today. Let's get to it right now with Mike Shogren. Hey guys, welcome in. Uh, we are going live here on Airbnb Masterminds with Mike Shogren uh, coming out of the Boston area. And if you haven't already seen, uh, Mike did a podcast with me. Actually, we've done a lot of stuff together, but we did a podcast uh, on the Fearless Investor probably, man, at this point, it's probably been a couple of years. Um, but his whole story is there. He's got an amazing one, especially one when it comes to, uh, you know, just his reason for why he's doing this business and his family. Um, got to even see a deeper version of that over in Nashville when we were there and then again in Houston. And you've got an amazing story, Mike, but I'm going to encourage people because today we're going to really dive deep into this strategy of going from short-term rentals into S or into uh, hotels, which you're just, you're killing it in regards to that. You even got another one under contract that I want to talk about today, but um, welcome in, man. I'm, I'm excited to do this again with you. Yeah. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah. Always great chatting. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, just, just so everyone knows here, you know, what's been great about this industry, right. Is that like all of us really got to know each other during COVID because we had nothing to do, but jump on clubhouse. And so Mike was one of those guys. And now we're super good friends and even hosted a mastermind together in Colorado with a few other coaches. And, and so um, we, we're going to have a good time on this one, but we're going to, like I said, get really deep into uh, the strategy as well. But before we do, Mike, um, can you just kind of like for 5,000 foot overview, kind of give people the backstory um, that haven't heard about you and um, would like to learn just kind of where you're at in your business today? Yeah, sure. So like the cliff notes version is I started this business back in 2017 um, you know, prior to that, I did what everybody told me to do. I went to school, I got good grades, I got a quote unquote, good job as a CPA. And, you know, had a decent salary, house in the burbs, a couple of cars in the garage with me and the wife. And then everything changed when our son was born. He had a very rare lung disease. Um, long story short, we spent a ton of time at the hospital. And at a certain point, I ran out of vacation time, I ran out of sick time, had all these hospital bills piling up. And I had to leave my wife, and my baby in the hospital to go back to a desk to trade time for money. And for those of you that are parents, you can imagine how that felt. And um, I told my wife the last day that I was in the hospital there, I said, listen, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to find a way to build us a business that gives us the income we want without ever trading time for money again. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, I was in a mastermind group and I learned about short-term rentals. And again, this was like way before it was like super cool and sexy. And I was pretty skeptical, but I was like, you know what, this logically seems to make sense. And so we got our first property going. Uh, the end of 2017. And within 15 months, I retired myself, my wife and my mom through short term rentals. Now fast forward a few years, we've got uh, 44 units live right now. We've got another 50 plus unit complex under contract. Um, that'll be our third hotel. We are operating in five different states at this point. Um, and my life is completely changed as a result of this industry. And that's why I'm so passionate about helping people get in and do it the right way um, so that they can change their lives too. So, so awesome. Uh, and, and as you guys are listening live here, let's start dropping some, some questions, uh, drop comments, press that like and love button. Like let's, let's start getting some engagement on this because you're going to be able to learn a lot here in the next call it 30 minutes here from, from Mike. And already, you know, one of the things I think that uh, Mike, you talk about a lot is just 
going back to when you first started, um, there's, there's one major like learning lesson that I know that you share with a lot of people that are just getting started and have this like kind of shiny object syndrome of multiple properties in multiple different areas. Cause that's kind of like what you did in the beginning. But if you were to go back, um, looking at the, what are you in five different States? Would you do it that way again? Or would you consolidate a little bit? Not in the way that I did it. Absolutely not. Like within that first 15 months, we were in five different States. Um, and it was crazy. And so if I was going to go back and do it over again, <clears throat> I would have dominated one market, built up a portfolio of anywhere from 20 to 40 units, and then moved to the next one. And then to the next one, because if you think of it, the, the real work, and again, there's a big distinction right now, and I'm going to do a YouTube video on this, but there's, there's a big distinction between having an Airbnb side hustle or short-term rental side hustle versus having a short-term rental business, right? And it's yeah. a lot of people jump into it as a side hustle and there's no right or wrong way to do it, but I want to be perfectly clear. If it's a side hustle, if you stop hustling, you stop making money. Okay. If you're not answering messages for guests, if you're not adjusting your pricing, if you're not going out and hunting for new listings, your business dies. Yep. When you build a business with a team that takes care of all the operations and the growth for you, then you own a business. And that's why Kyle and I can go to Breckenridge for a week or go to Miami or Houston or wherever. And our business keeps chugging along because we have people in place that are running the business, right? So it's a big distinction, but the hard part is getting really good boots on the ground yeah. that you can trust so even if you have a great operations backend team, you still need good boots on the ground. So think of building five rock solid teams in five different states versus one rock solid team in one location, right? I, I five X the amount of work that I needed to do to get the yeah. same result. And yes, there is the idea of like diversity, right? And, and spreading the risk. But I think the big part is making sure that you're solid in one area and have that pretty much dialed in and plug and play automated, whatever word you want to use, but where you're only having to put in a couple hours a week to that one market. That's the time when you say, okay, a couple hours a week, 10 properties, 15 properties, whatever that looks like. It's making me $10,000 a month, but I've got a clone of myself taking over all the, the operation side of it on a daily basis. Now it's time to look in that new, new market. That's the way that that I did it. That's the way that I teach. And I, I think that's kind of essentially now if it, what you're saying, if you were to go back instead of saying yes, to all these different areas, that's probably how you would do it. Yeah. And that's kind of adjusted our strategy. Like as of right now, like we're focused on buying more hotels uh, just outside of Boston, like, you know, locally to me, cause I know that market super well and I know what's going to work and what's not. And then for the single family stuff, we're investing down in like the Kissimmee area. Cause again, I know that area really well now the regulations aren't going anywhere. Like it's, it's good if you do it right. So those are kind of my two markets that I'm focused on right now. That's awesome. Okay. So, and guys, I see your questions coming in. Uh, if, if it's applicable to something that we're talking about, I'm going to go ahead and throw it in there, but wait till the end. And I will make sure uh, the majority of questions get answered. Mike, you're popular because we already have like 10 questions listed here. So we, right. we might be going a few minutes later. Um, so Tell me about your, so you, you said 40 plus units, right? And I know that two of those are boutique hotels. Um, how many units did you have before that first boutique hotel came as an option for you? Right around that 15, we were like launching a few others that would have put us over 20. And then it was right around that 15 month mark, uh, okay. maybe 18 months. And <clears throat> uh, an investor that I was co-hosting a property for, um, found the deal. He owns a brokerage. He found the deal. He brought it to me and he was like, Hey man, you know, you're crushing it with this single family. Would your systems work at scale on this commercial building? Like a, like a hotel. And so we went and looked at it and I was like, yeah, I think it would. And at the time, like there's more people doing this now, but at the time I didn't know anybody that had done a hotel deal like this. Yeah. So I was like, okay, yeah. Like this makes sense. Like my operations are tight. I know how to run you know, the turnover process and the guest, like the whole business, I get it from a short-term rental standpoint. Can I apply this to a boutique hotel? Right. And the answer was yes. And there were definitely some learning lessons along the way and things that we had to adjust. Like I talked about in Breckenridge and I'm happy to do that here, but like yeah. it wasn't that long into it. The only thing that I would say is a lot of people hit me up on Instagram now, cause I'm posting content about hotels and they're like, yeah, I want to get a hotel. And I'm like, well, let's, let's learn to crawl and walk before you run. You don't want to just jump in I remember I had a call with somebody 
probably nine months ago. And he's like, Hey, I got a 20 unit hotel under contract. Um, and then I'm like, okay, like what's your plan? You have no experience, you know, whatever. And he didn't want to hire me for coaching. He didn't want, any, he was just like, Hey, can you give me some tips? And I'm like, dude, you just spent many, many millions of dollars to buy something that you have no idea what to do with. You got, you, you got to have some type of plan in place here. Like this is yeah. banana. So I would recommend getting a few STRs, learning how to run a single family right. home and then scale it up from there just to clarify. Yeah, no, that's good. I, I, I think, you know, back up one second, this, this opportunity that came your way, how many units was it? It was 13. Yep. Okay. So you're literally going to double your number of units overnight. How scary, intimidating was that, or was it not? It definitely was. I think my wife was more scared than I was. And I remember we, uh, our neighbor was, is a very wealthy guy and my wife's been friends with his family since they were kids. Like they grew up in the same neighborhood and, um, you know, she kind of watched him build this wealth over time. Right. He started out, you know, self-made all this stuff. And he, we had a meeting with him when we were getting this rolling and he looked at us and she was asking him all these questions. He said, he looked her dead in the eye and he said, you know what though? He said, if you want to get rich, you got to put your nuts on the table every once in a while. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny, but it's, it's totally true. And most people, they have these big goals, which is great. But when the rubber meets the road, that's when it gets scary. And the question is, are you going to push through that fear and go for it? Or are you going to retreat back in your comfort zone? Yeah. And that's, that's really what separates the big boys and girls from the ones that never get to that level is some, it's sometimes you just got to go for it. Yeah. Fear, fear either makes you curl up into a ball or it makes, or it motivates you to get in action. Level up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question here from Victoria, just in your experience, right? You just mentioned that there were a few learning curves. What was the biggest difference? If someone were to ask you, what's the difference between a boutique hotel and a short-term rental? How would you answer that? So in hindsight, now the two the hotels that we currently have running two very different types of properties. The first one that we got is a true boutique hotel. It's like a huge old Victorian mansion that they converted into an inn over time. The second one is basically a 20 unit apartment complex. That's like, you know, that garden style apartment or motel look where there's three floors. You can drive up, you can see the door numbers. It's easy to find their rooms. The first one, the lesson learned was I plan to run that whole thing remote, just like I do for my STRs. What I found later, you know, we turned it into a very high end boutique hotel, you know, nightly rates four to 600 bucks a night, a lot more needy guests, Mm. a lot harder to get them to their rooms with all these internal hallways. And it's like, Hey, go up this flight of stairs and make a left and go up this flight of stairs, blah, blah, blah. People were getting lost. People were getting pissed. You know, they're spending all this money. And what we had to do is pivot and basically staff that hotel Mm. Um, where the second one we run that one completely remote. Like all it's actually 21 units now is completely remote. Like there's nobody there. Um, so there's two different types of like quote unquote boutique hotels. I call it like the multi-unit, like that 20 unit complex versus a true boutique, which is like kind of that in style type of property. Got it. Got it. And so when you say staffing, who would be on a staff for a boutique hotel? So ideally, like we just have, we don't, we still don't have like a front desk, like they, we have a beautiful club room that people can hang out in, like a cool lounge. And then we have an office tucked in the back. So it's not like they need to go check in and like get keys. It's still all, you know, keyless locks, all the Wi-Fi locks, same thing for the SDRs. But there's somebody on site that if a guest has an issue during business hours, like they're there to assist them. And we still have the 24 hour, you know, 24 seven phone support with my team overseas that knows that property like the back of their hand now. But it, it just it made everything run so much smoother when we had somebody on site that could go address something quickly. Okay. Awesome. So what I'm hearing really is the the multi-unit is essentially just like getting an apartment complex and and running your, your usual business where the other one is going to be more of, Hey, we're giving you kind of a a higher end experience um, or at least a higher end because you're paying more. We gotta, we gotta give you at least a little bit more of a customized experience. Is that the only difference is the price or is it the setup as well? I think it was more of the layout of the property and the type of guest experience that we wanted them to have. Right. And so since we've opened a few years ago, we added a bar, right? So I need bar staff. I needed to get everybody tip certified, get my liquor license, meal license, all these different things. We've got a parking lot. 
Um, this property is literally like oceanfront, like right on the beach. So we have a parking lot that we rent out as well for beach parking. So I've got, you know, high school kids work in the parking lot, right? So there's, we took the cleaning team in-house because it's like somewhat of a remote property and our third-party cleaners couldn't really get it done. So like now it is fully staffed, like all in-house, like W2 people, parking lot kids are 1099 over the summer, but like everybody else is pretty much like W2. Yeah. Um, and so it's more like the layout of the property and the type of guest experience that you want. So with all those moving parts, how much were you involved in that when you, when you first opened up? So at the very beginning, okay, I didn't put any money in that deal, okay? But I own a third of it, all right? So I raised the money from the two investors. They put up all the money and I got a third ownership and I just charged a really low management fee because I wanted equity in this deal. So mm. it was like bare minimum management fee. And the plan was to renovate this property you know, take it from like a C class asset to like a B plus a minus really nice property and then refinance it, get all their money out and then go do it again somewhere else. So the first year I basically ran that thing myself, mm. kept our expenses super, wow. super low. Then when we went back to the bank a year and a half later, we refinanced it. We took it from a $2.2 million property to a five and a half million dollar property in a year and a half. That's awesome. Refinanced it, pulled all that cash out and some split that extra three ways. And then I staffed it up after that. <laughs> Cause once we get the refi done, I'm like, okay, we're good. I got your money out. Now I'm going to pull back and staff this thing so I can focus on other things. Okay. So big thing there, you went from a 2.2 million to over 5.5. Was it just renovations? Was it the way you were running it? Like what made that value go up so much? Both. Both. Yeah. So like the, Again, real estate is all about location. The location of this property is freaking amazing. Like again, it's oceanfront, like it's stunning. So we took this beat up hotel that was basically run into the ground, put 600 grand into it. Wow. Made it look unbelievable. Put in an outdoor bar, all these amazing things. Increase the nightly rate from like 180 to 400. Wow. Reduce the expenses from like 70% to 40%. Wow. So in commercial real estate, everything is valued based off of your net operating income. Basically, yep. how much cash is this thing producing? So if you can double the amount of cash that it produces, you double the value of the property. So that's essentially what we did is we implemented all the systems from the STRs, reduce the overhead, tighten up the operations, increase the revenue through the renovations and a better guest experience. And then the byproduct of that is doubling the value of the hotel. So I just want to clarify that for anyone that's jumping in here and, you know, they're really excited about, you know, management or arbitrage from an owning standpoint, right? Like the goal is eventually you build up the cash flow and then you start owning properties if you don't have the, the cash to go buy already. When, when you're going to buy a short-term rental single family home, it does not matter how that thing performs. They, when you sell that, unless you have a cash buyer who is using it as an investment and says, I don't care what the comps in the area say, I'm willing to buy this thing for twice the you know single family home next door. Unless you have that kind of buyer, it's going to be comped compared to a short term or compared to a single family home next door that probably sold to mom, dad, and their two kids. When you have a actual commercial building, like what Mike is talking about, it is based on the performance. So if this thing makes a million dollars and you have 40% of your uh, you know, million dollars is your expenses, the net operating income for that year is $600,000. Mike, once you have the net in operating income though, can you just fill in that gap? How does that determine the value of the property once you have that NOI? Yeah. So the value of the property is the net operating income divided by a capitalization rate. Okay. For a hotel, it'll be anywhere from, for the types of properties that we're going to go after. Okay. It'll be anywhere from an eight to a 12% capitalization. So in a simple example, a million dollars divided by 10% or a 10 cap, that's a $10 million property. Yeah. Right. So it's basic math. What that cap rate is again, to level the playing field. If I have a hotel that's doing a million dollars a year, but it's old and it's beat up, and it maybe doesn't look that great, but Kyle has a hotel that's also doing a million dollars a year, but his is brand new, beautiful, in a better location. His property should be worth more, right? Just logically. Mm -hmm. So the cap rate I use is like this 
risk factor uh, adjustment for pricing. Awesome. Okay. So that's, and, and this is the beauty of commercial real estate. This is Mike, just so we can get, you don't have to use numbers, but like percentage wise of your net worth, how much is in just even your current one that you own uh, as a partner through? This I mean, if you guys can do the math, if I own a third of a property that has $2.2 million of equity in it, yeah, you guys can do that math and figure out like seven hundred thousand dollars right there. Yeah, and now it's worth more than that, so it's roughly eight hundred and fifty grand in equity in that deal. And and I put no money in it, by the way. Yeah. And what I heard was you just busted your ass for a year, yep. right? And now it's automated. So not only are you and you're getting cash flow from that too. Yeah. Yeah. So you're getting management cash flow. fee and a cash flow yeah, at the end get, of the year from that profit. Management fee, cash flow, plus it added. Now eight hundred fifty thousand dollars to his overall net worth. Is that worth a year of busting your ass? To me, absolutely, hundred percent. Okay, so now you've got this property that you're closing on fifty seven units. How did you find this puppy? Same thing. The same guy that brought me the first one. Wow. And the same guy that brought me the second one. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Yeah. One relationship. So, okay. <clears throat> one relationship. So again, he found the deal. He's been following up with the owner of this property for a long time. Owner had some health issues recently. They're like, all right, I'm ready to let it go. Like, I can't do it anymore. <clears throat> Again, good location, good size, poorly run, needs a shitload of work. Um, getting it, I don't want to talk too much numbers because I haven't closed this one yet. But let's okay. just say by the time we're done, we should have between four and $5 million of equity in this deal by the time it's like done and renovated. And is this again between three or is it just the two of you? Yep. Same okay. three. Okay. Yeah. That's, yep. That's awesome. All right. Um, what, what is it like? I know this one is going to be a big renovation. Um, I know you said you don't want to talk numbers, but do you have a range of how much you expect the renovations on this to be? Yeah. Like 4.2 million. <laughs> okay. How in the world are you managing that? Um. <laughs> From what the managing the renovation or managing, yeah. managing the money to do the renovation? Both. Let's let's say both. <laughs> um, so for the money piece, leveraging an SBA loan, um, still gonna have to put a lot of cash in. I'm actually gonna put money in this deal. We're gonna okay. be like splitting the cash. So I'll be into it for quite a bit of my own money, but um, totally worth it. And again, for those of you that are co-hosting at a certain point. I think it's important that you shift into more of that investor mindset of putting yeah. your own skin in the game, um, getting out there, shifting your identity to not just being an operator, but an investor. And I think that's very important. And that'll happen over time. Um, right. From a management standpoint, um, again, part of the reason why our partnership works so well is I bring the operational expertise. They bring the construction expertise. So from a managing the construction and reno, they're going to help manage a lot of that. Awesome. Our team will do all the design and then our team will do the management after. That's awesome. What was it that uh, TJ talked about when we were in Breckenridge, when you're partnering up, it's either time, money, or knowledge that you're bringing to the table. So, yeah. so you're bringing a little bit of the, you're bringing a little bit of all the pieces there, but sounds like in terms of the knowledge you're bringing in the, here's what it should look like. And they're bringing in the knowledge of how to be able to renovate that and take over that side of it to manage the team. Yes. hundred percent. Cool. That's, that's good, man. Okay. We got some really good questions um, that I want to at least start throwing a few in here. Um, and, and I've got a few more of my own as well, but um, along the lines of you just saying you, you found this deal through relationships and through really just one relationship. Um, John is asking, what marketing methods do you use to find the hotel? So I guess just to uh, twist. I leverage this. relationships. So like right. the way that I look at it is the more relationships that I build <clears throat> with people that know what I do, they become my sales force, right? They go out and find me deals because again, I don't want to spend my time. There's a lot of things that I can do. And what I like doing is this stuff and helping other people and then plugging in more properties into my team on the back end. So I don't go out and look for deals <clears throat> most of the time, unless again, it's in Kissimmee and I like going down there and I'm like, all right, let's go house shopping. But like, other than that, I leverage my connections. Now those take time to develop, 
right? And what, again, going back to the persistence thing and having a clear reason why you want to do this, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have good days, bad days, really shit days, Mm -hmm. but you need to persist, right? So everybody's like, wow, like he was out of his job in 15 months. I want to put this in context from the time I got my first deal that I bought to the time I got my first co-host deal. It took me nine months to get that deal. And then it just blew up. So I was hosting regular monthly meetups, like educating, like networking with investors. I had three months that I hosted a meetup and nobody showed up. Like mm. the venue was like, please dude, like, why don't you go home? And I'm like, all right guys, we'll see you next month. Right. I just kept going. And I met that investor because he came to my meetup on the last month that I hosted it. So if mm. I quit, I never would have met that person. Wow. So That's- like, you never know who you're going to meet. And it's building like real relationships. It's not just like, you know, I go golfing with this guy. Like I've been to his wedding. Like I, you know what I mean? Like I've built a true relationship with these people. That's solid, man. And that to me is the name of, especially anything in real estate is you didn't fail. You just didn't endure the pain long enough right? Like it's because you just, it's not because door knocking didn't work. It's because you didn't knock on enough doors. Right. And, and that's, that's, what's so powerful about this. I talked to so many people, whether you're trying to own arbitrage or co-host and they're like, yeah, I, you know, I've tried and it's just not working. I'm doing something wrong. And it's like, how many people have you talked to five? No, that's, that's, that's not doing this business. It's like what you said, like you're, you're, it's a, it's a side hustle, right? You're not taking it serious enough for this to actually make you money. Um, Man, that's good. I, I really, I really like that you just shared that. Um, good question here from Way. He says, "How do you vet a deal?" I guess just to get more specific, what about that first deal? How are you finding comps? How are you deciding how much it was going to make? Um, let's just kind of go back to that. Yeah. So there's there's a few different ways to do it. I will tell you guys that we are spoiled as STR investors. Okay, we have sites like STR Insights and AirDNA that you can get actual data on specific properties in your market. Hotel space doesn't work that way. The best that you can do is spend $500 for one report that gives you an average of a comp set that you give them, but you can't see what each individual property is doing. You just see an average of here's the average occupancy, here's the average nightly rate, here's the average rev bar, here's the average revenue. Like that's it. You, you, you can't really get in the weeds. So all that I knew was that this property was substantially undervalued because I knew the market it had huge upside because I saw the numbers that this guy was doing. And then I honestly went on air DNA and I started analyzing studios and one beds in that market. Yeah. And I'm like, Hmm. And then I went on to uh, Google and booking.com and Expedia and hotels.com. And I started looking at what were the other rates that other properties were charging and what did those other properties look like? And I was like, man, we can build the best product in this entire town and absolutely dominate this market. And that's what we did. Like our, our nightly rates are way higher than anybody else in our market, but we, we fill it because it's just a unique product. And we knew who we were going after. We were going after, you know, I don't want to say wealthy, but well-to-do professionals in Boston between 28 and 45 that were going to get away for the weekend and wanted a nice place to go on the beach. And they didn't want to go to the Cape. And there was nothing really drawing them up towards us on the North shore. It's like, if we build a killer product, we're good. But again, it's just getting back to basic business principles of like, who am I, what problem am I solving and who am I trying to solve it for? And when you get clear on that avatar, a lot of the other ends up there, they serve a specific demographic. And a lot of them tend to be an older demographic. So when you go in that property, it feels like grandma's house (laughs) and that works for them. But they're not going to command the kind of race that we do. And they're not going to reduce their overhead like we do by having you know, keypad locks, you try and get an older person to figure that shit out. And they're like calling and screaming at you and leaving you bad reviews. Cause they're like, dude, this is not a hotel. Yeah. We're like, it's kind of is, and it kind of isn't. Yeah. Well, what's, what's key to me there is even though you are quote unquote, getting a boutique hotel, you're still using sites like air DNA. You're still looking at Airbnb. So my question is, what are all the sites that you're listing on and then comparing the boutique hotel to the multi-unit mm. percentage wise, where are you seeing the most bookings? So it's, 
if you rely on Airbnb for a hotel, you are screwed. Okay. Okay. So 70% of my bookings are direct. Nice. Direct bookings through our website. Okay. About 15, uh, probably 20 to 25% is booking.com. Wow. And the rest is Airbnb. So it's like five to 15% maybe wow. Airbnb. Very, very small percentage. Because think of it. People are going to Airbnb to book a house. They're not going on there to book a hotel. Yeah. So that's not where your demographic is lying. Booking.com, as much of a pain in the ass as they can be, drives a decent amount of bookings. What really drives the bookings is getting involved with like Google and getting your Google My Business page set up and driving as many five-star reviews to Google like you would for Airbnb. So now when somebody looks at our property, we have like 400 reviews on Google at like a 4.8 review score. That drives a lot of just organic search results when people are searching for like hotels in whatever city you're in. And then they, re they look at the Google reviews. Like that's, that's the Airbnb right there. Yeah. It's driving those Google reviews. And then we get involved in the local community as well. Like we're part of the chamber. I know all the other local businesses. We pass business back and forth. They refer people to us all the time. Um, you know, just building relationships. So Mike, this really is, even though it's in the same industry, right? Hospitality and real estate. This really is a different business model than short-term rentals, right? We're, on short-term rentals, typically, even if you're just getting started super easy, you list on Airbnb, as long as it's unique and different, it's going to get bookings. This, you're telling us, you know, if you're relying on Airbnb, you're kind of screwed. So a lot of upside in regards to equity, but I guess timing, right? Like when, what is the right timing for someone to jump in and really try their hand at a boutique hotel? It depends on what your goal is, right? And that's why, like, we've talked about this offline at nauseum with our mastermind students and, you know, in Breck, it's like, you got to decide what is your end game. You know, if you just want to make an extra five to 10K a month, it's pretty fairly straightforward to do that with short-term rentals, right? Like it's, it's not that complicated. If you want to build wealth and like seven figure income levels, okay, that's cool, but why? And are you willing to put in the work to make that happen? Mm, yeah. right? it's, it's just two different things. And just be honest with yourself. There's no right or wrong answer, but it's like, what is the lifestyle that I want to create? And I'll be totally honest. When I got started, my goal was 15K a month because that could get me and my wife out. That would like cover the bills plus some and we'd be comfortable. And then I fell in love with teaching. I always knew I, I, when I was younger, I just assumed that like one day I was going to be a college professor because I always loved teaching. And that was going to be like my retirement gig or whatever. And then when I started teaching this stuff, my business coach was like, Hey man, you're not stopping at 20. And I was like, why dude? I'm like, I'm good. Like I, we're bringing in, he's like, because if you want to be a good teacher, you're going to have to constantly level your game up. Yeah. Because somebody's going to come to you that wants to get to 30 units or wants to do a hotel deal or wants to do a baller house in Florida. Like you have to constantly level up to stay relevant and be able to educate people to the level that they want to be educated at. So that selfishly is what continues to drive me to keep going bigger and bigger. It's not for the money. It's to see how far I can push myself and then offer that value back to students. That's awesome, man. Uh, good time to even just bring this up. If, if someone is interested in joining your mastermind and, and getting some help from you, what's the best place for them to go? Um, I've got a 30 minute masterclass. You can check out at strsecrets.com. If you want to skip that and literally just apply, you just go to strsecrets.com slash apply. I'll be honest. It's not cheap, but it's only for people that are serious. And they're like, no, I want to get to at least a six figure income level from this, ideally a seven figure income level. But like, I'm just telling you right now, it's not cheap. So, so guys, you know, I've got my own out there as well. And I wouldn't be telling you this if this was not the case. There's about five coaches out there that I would say, I would much rather you go to them than try to learn something from me. If you're serious about getting into short-term rentals and pivoting into boutique hotels, like Mike is the guy. You, you should just go ahead and start straight with him. And if you are going to go there, you said strsecrets.com, right? Yeah. And when you fill out the form, if you want to go ahead and say that you heard about him, through me, wink, um, yeah, <laughs> go, ahead, that. go ahead and do that. Uh, but seriously, my, Mike is the guy for this. And, and I would send anyone over his way before asking for, uh, for them to join my program. A um, couple more questions here from, from the audience, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap this thing up. But 
a uh, couple people are asking about just the the capital raising, the financing, you know, kind of the structuring the the money behind the deal. Is there a overview that you could give for that of how that is going to look different than maybe a single family home? Yeah, and I'll be honest, I feel like raising money for a single family home is a lot harder mm. because like when you start working with investors, one of the first questions they're going to ask is how quickly am I going to get my money back? Right? Like how quickly can I recycle this money to do more investments? And it's a lot harder, especially right now with rising interest rates and realistically, real estate prices will come down on single family homes. Yeah. If you're raising money to buy a single family home right now and you're not doing some extensive reno to force that value way up, it's going to be very hard for you to refinance and get their money out. Yeah. Okay. That's the first point. The second point is not all money is good money. Not all money is good money. Okay. So it is crucial that you find partners that are in alignment with your vision and the goals that you have. Okay. Yep. Because if you get an investor that, you know, wants to work with you and then they start micromanaging the hell out of you and then they're constantly hounding you and your vision is, Hey, this is a 10 year hold. I want to get it to this and then we'll refi in 10 years or whatever, but they want their money out in three years. You're going to have a problem. Or if they want you to do, to push the envelope a little bit or, cut corners and certain things or not invest the money to get the property to where it needs to be. That's not what you want. The reason why ours works so well is because we've built a relationship. We trust each other. We meet every single month. We review all the financials in detail. There's full transparency and everybody knows their lane. Like that's just why it works. And we had a similar vision for where we wanted to go with each of the properties. And we had full buy-in from everybody. I think that's good what you just said there. Everyone knows their lane. The last thing that you want to do is bring in a million dollars and that person wants to tell you how to do your side of the business, right? Um, I see people do that all the time with co-hosting, right? The yeah. owner wants to like tell you how to price the property. Yeah. I'm like, dude, you hired me. Shut up. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and you use those, those exact words with them too, right? That's why I don't talk to them. My team talks to them. Uh, I love it, man. Um, all right, we've got... One more question here. And by the way, I see uh, Amy says that she's building her own boutique hotel. Congrats on that. That's Love awesome. It. New construction. Um, Edwin says, um, what about the amenities? How do you decide what amenities are going to be here um, when you're vetting the property? So the first property that we bought actually had a full commercial kitchen. Now, that thing was super outdated and we would have had to upgrade it, but let's just say it was perfect mm -hmm. and could have run. I don't know anything about running a restaurant. And from my understanding, it is one of the most challenging businesses to make profitable. Yeah. So from the get go, I was like, we are not running this like a restaurant. We converted the whole restaurant area into that club room lounge that guests could hang out. If it's a rainy day, we've got huge TVs. We've got shuffleboard. We've got all these cool swing chairs. Like we made it into like a lounge for the guests. So like, I don't know anything about restaurants. I didn't want to run a restaurant. All right. Over time, as we built, like we have this huge, awesome deck that lit just looks over the ocean. And we were like, man, it would be super cool if we had like, even just a seasonal bar that people could even just get like beer and wine and like, just look at the ocean over here. Like it's, yeah. it would be epic. Right. So we started exploring that more. It took me nine months to get that liquor license. Um, but we got it, nice. but I'll be fully transparent. That bar doesn't make shit. It like breaks even, okay. but it's a really cool amenity for the guests, yeah. which is why we keep it. Well, it probably drives occupancy, right? Yeah. And it's just yeah. like, it's like, oh, this is sweet. They have, and we don't even run it every day. Like right now it's closed for the season, but during yeah. the summer, it runs Thursday to Sunday from like two to eight. So it's like afternoon. And then we shut it down at eight. But it, it's enough of like a nice draw for somebody coming down. Hey, let's grab a drink before dinner. And it's just nice to be able to have that amenity for the guests. Nice. So again, it's coming back down to who, do, who are you going to serve? How are you going to make your property stand out from your competition? And what type of nightly rate could you get to justify the amenities? Just like you would for an STR, right? Yeah. And we don't need to go down the rabbit hole of that house I did in Florida, but that took a lot of money to do what we did at that property. Yeah. With that guest experience, I was confident that those amenities would get me a premium on the nightly rate. And Mike, we're going to have this thing 
listed in uh, the Facebook group. I think everyone would love to see that, that listing. If you want to just drop that in the comments, cause that, yeah. I mean, you, like you said, that's a whole other conversation that is still to this day, the most awesome short-term rental I've seen. <laughs> so uh, you guys got to check that one out. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Mike. Uh, this has been super, super helpful. Uh, love the engagement on this. Had a lot of questions. And um, I think the next step, like you said, is strsecretslive.com. Go on to that. Check out that masterclass. Is there any other uh, place that you'd like people to start following you? And by the way, he's the host of the STR Secrets Live podcast. Um, so go check the podcast out. Check the YouTube channel out. Anything else? Uh, that's pretty much it. I was just going to say, check out, check out the podcast. Um, you know, I know Kyle and I love doing that stuff and it's just a way for people to, again, we only have so much time in something like this, but if you follow Kyle's podcast, you find my podcast, you, you can kind of follow the journey along the way, you know, going back years to see where we were versus how we got to where we are. Um, so it's just a really cool way to engage. And then, you know, my Instagram is the, the Airbnb guy you can check that out too and hey we would be we would be dumb not to mention this you had the biggest short-term rental host driven event ever uh that that i'm aware of and that was in nashville last year it's happening again uh when is it and how can people go and get their tickets yeah so the tickets have not officially gone on sale yet um i just threw that link in the chat by the way or in the facebook group Perfect. Um, but it will be March 20th to the 22nd in Nashville. Again, it'll be at the wild horse saloon. The venue was sick. Uh, we had a thousand awesome. people last year. We'll have a thousand people this year. Uh, we've got a killer, uh, lineup of speakers and key, uh, I've got a keynote, uh, a little secret. If you guys have read profit first, you're going to know who the keynote speaker is. Um, so super pumped about that. If you haven't read profit first, I highly encourage you to, cause it'll really help you manage your cash flow. Um, but you can go to strwealthconference.com and check out all the details over there. And then tickets should be going on sale in about a week. And this is in March 23, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, March 20th to the 22nd, 2023. I'm still bummed that you picked that date, man. I'm a month after my kid is born, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get out of that. <laughs> well, you and I are both in the doghouse because I didn't realize it, but we're supposed to go to that Florida house for two weeks, right in the middle of those dates. And Kristen's ready to kill me. Oh so, no. <laughs> I'm like, sorry, I didn't know that. Um, oh no. boy. Oh anyway. boy. <laughs> uh, you just need one more, one more uh, look up from your kid is saying, but daddy, it's vacation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and then exactly. you're done. Exactly. Uh, all right, guys. Uh, Check out everything that Mike just mentioned. Check out the podcast, the YouTube channel, strwealthconference.com and strsecrets.com. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for jumping on here and helping us to conquer the world of not just Airbnb, but boutique hotels too. So again, go follow Mike, STR Secrets. That's his podcast. That's also the name of his Facebook group. If you're ready to get started in any sort of hotels, you need to also jump into his mastermind group. You can find that actually through uh, STR Secrets and make sure that when you go and uh, have that call with him, you just go ahead and say that you found out about him through this podcast so that he can expedite that and make sure that you get the uh, the information that you need for that. So if, if you're ready to go do that, just go to STR Secrets, get started and uh, looking forward to seeing you on the next one here. Thanks so much for joining us on the Fearless Investor Podcast. We're helping you to conquer the world of Airbnb.